Welcome to Beyond the Breakwater, where just beyond the crashing waves of fear, discomfort, and doubt lies the greatest potential for life transformation. We want to guide you into the open waters where the calculated risk you take becomes the turning point for you or your organization to thrive. So drop your anchors and prepare for departure in this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater. All right, we are back with another episode of Beyond the Breakwater. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Lindsay, and with me is Ed, and I am super excited for today's discussion because we have a special guest. Mm -hmm. So if you don't recognize this guy, you're going to get to know him today. Um, Matt, welcome to Beyond the Breakwater. Thank you. I am also on the show. Yes. Yes, yes, you are. (laughs) It's good to be here. (laughs) So Matt, give the listeners kind of an overview, just like who are you? Um, What kind of things do you like? What's the landscape of your life looking like? What do you do? Sure. Yeah. I'm uh, so I'm an associate pastor at Messiah Church in Midland, Michigan. I am 33, and I have a wife and two kids. My kids are five and three. And they're both girls, so I'm surrounded by women, <laughs> um, and it's just amazing. I love being a girl dad. I love being a husband to my wife Nissa, and um, yeah, I've been all over the map. But I've been in ministry for six, going on seven years, I think, and. Um, started out as a church planner in Hoboken, New Jersey, and now I'm here in Midland, uh, continuing the missional track um, and everything that we're doing with the Beyond the Breakwater stuff. It's just been amazing. So I love that. I love playing some golf. Love going sailing in the summertime, hitting the beach, and listening to Forrest Frank as we and I, you and I both really <laughs> yeah, we involved. both yeah. bond over that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good music. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's a uh, yes. And that is a good segue to what we're talking about because he is dominating the youth of today <laughs> in I have music. No idea what you're talking about? <laughs> Cue up, Forrest <laughs> Frank. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Ed, well, now we're going to kind of jump into like the discussion for today. Being Gen Z, millennials, we kind of talked about it in some of um, our previous episodes back when we talked about church trends for 2024. Super great discussion, and we just kind of want to continue that. And that kind of piqued your interest, Ed. And I think if I know anything about you, you kind of hyper fixate on some some topics in a, in a good way. Like you jump into things that are really interesting to you and learn everything that you can about them. And I think one of those things right now for you is the future church, the next generation, understanding Gen Z, millennials. So Ed, why has that piqued your curiosity and why is it an important discussion that we're having? I think I'm really intrigued. Uh, first of all, welcome, Matt. Thank so you. glad you're here. Good to have you on the podcast. And Lindsay, always good to mm-hmm. um, banter back and forth with you. Mm-hmm. And you always have great questions. Um, this is a really important conversation for the church. Uh, because um, if I give you maybe just a little bit of an overview, um, most senior pastors are right around my age. They're turning 60. I think the majority of pastors are turning 60 this year. Um, so they're boomers. Um, I just heard yesterday I was in a meeting that um, the church at large is in um, serious decline. Um, So if the boomers are leading the charge and the church is in serious decline and we're looking to younger generations, and uh, I think I'm looking differently than than others. You know, I've been around church long enough to hear people say, you know, oh, we got to get some young people in here. And what they really mean is um, we just need more people and, and to maybe make our church a little bit younger. We like to see some kids around. But they really don't mean we want younger people in leadership, and we really want the younger people to take over the church and lead the church. Um, So when you say I'm a little more fixated on this because uh, I feel like part of my role is preparing the church for your generation. Mm -hmm. And, And you know we've had a lot of conversations both on the podcast and in staff and in leadership at Messiah of I'm not waiting Let's start doing that now. Let's start the process now. So we're bringing young leaders into the leadership team. Um, I love staffing younger. Um, in fact, I think we've mentioned before, you know, we have somebody in their 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, and 20s. Uh, we have all generations on staff, and it just gives a really good perspective, mm-hmm. and I think we can bring that perspective. Um, but I'm really excited today because as I've been looking at Uh, Millennials, you know, millennials are born typically from about 1982 uh, to about 2000 is kind of the homework that I was doing. 1991. Yeah, I figured, Matt, you're right in there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then starting at 2000 or 2001 
you know, that's when um, Gen Z, um, maybe a little bit younger. Um, I know, Lindsay, you're in that maybe 97-ish mm -hmm. um, and beyond. So it's kind of like two generations. And so I thought this would be really good today mm -hmm. to just have both of you on here to say, you know, as we look at Beyond, uh, Beyond the Breakwater, which is what the podcast is all about, and now we have two gener three generations represented mm -hmm. looking at it differently. And, and I'll just say, I think my interest in this actually comes from a meeting I was in yesterday that it was all boomers and uh, maybe some Gen X, you know, some that were a little bit younger than me, uh, some that were older than me. And it's interesting to hear them talk about the church. It's very different talking to them about the church than the conversations we've had mm. about the church and what the church can look like. Where do you see them differing? Uh, I see them differing because if I would give a very broad generalization, I see the boomers as living in the harbor and being very content sitting in the harbor and becoming very busy in the harbor um, and getting caught up in decades of harbor ministry, which they maybe not even realize they are. And I'm watching, um, Lindsay, your generation, and Matt, we want to really pick your brain on this. Your generation's coming with purpose. And we. so I almost think you're starting from beyond the breakwater. Mm -hmm. And and that's where our conversation's going to go today. Like, like, why? What is it about you guys growing up in this era, both of you, um, what is it about you growing up in this era that you have much more meaning and purpose, that you're seeking meaning and purpose in life? Uh, the boomers seem to be much more in the harbor. So why are you guys beyond the breakwater naturally? Mm -hmm. Why are boomers in the harbor? Yeah. I think that's my intrigue. It's a good question. I think, Matt, I kind of want to hear your response. Mm -hmm. Like, would you agree with, with what's being said so far? Yeah, I think, I mean, in some ways... We could probably hit the boomers pretty hard, but I think uh, culturally they had a lot going for them as far as where people's heads and their hearts were at. I think culturally in America we had a far more Christianized yes. culture, mm -hmm. and so mission could be the attractional church. It could be the Willow Creek. It could be the Bill Hype, like that kind of... Um, uh, purpose-driven life, Rick Warren, like mm -hmm. these huge churches that had really compelling, really cool, like this is slick, like the presentation's fantastic, they have art, they have theater, like all these kinds of things that really seem to be compelling and attractive to people who might have been, they are, they're Christian, but their boat was kind of old and crusty and, you know, there's weird things on it, you know, like, <laughs> and they're like, I don't, I don't want to be part of that kind of church. And so they kind of hopped onto the dock and they're meandering, not committing, not so that it was positive in that way that they got them on a boat, but incidentally that boat was just meant to attract them and get them into the in onto a boat, not in off of the dock. So it's like, okay, is that mission the same? And I don't think it's the same at all today. Mm -hmm. I think more and more it's I mean, it's everywhere you already alluded to it, the trends are everywhere in our culture that the church is in decline and people are just secularized. They don't want, they don't have an interest in the church. They don't think the church is anything to offer. Christianity is like, we've kind of, we tried that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and this isn't really our bag. Mm -hmm. um, and less and less, even there's there the expectation in culture to say, be the Christmaster, the Christmas and Easter Christian. Like I've done my time and I'm going to, I'm part of, I'm part of that church because I've gone to both of those services. But mm -hmm. that's not even really, people kind of check out because mm -hmm. this is not, there's no value there. Mm -hmm. So, Lindsay, we've talked in the past about how yeah. it seems like Gen Z really is seeking for meaning and purpose, looking yeah. vocationally. I'd love for you to speak to that. Like, mm -hmm. why is that almost natural for your generation? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, Matt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back around and say, is it the same for your generation mm -hmm. as millennials? Because mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think it might be different. Yeah, I, I've... I've read a lot about Gen Z and listened to a lot of like thought leaders on this. I'm not an expert by any means. Like I'm kind of teetering the line of older Gen Z or baby millennial. And so just in in looking at the culture of how like my generation was growing up and what we were exposed to, like we've kind of always had 
smartphones. We've not just like flip phones, like my, like, yeah, we've had some, but then it was like, we've always had smartphones. We've always had technology. Mm -hmm. We don't really remember 9-11, um, but we've been exposed to a lot of um, like quote unquote bad information or like negative news always at any given time. Like I think I read something that was like on any given day, the average message that my generation is taking in is 10,000 messages a day. Wow. And you ask Gen Z, like, how are you feeling? And it is overwhelmed. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, that is why. Mm. And it's like at any point we open up our phones and we can see different like news headlines that are happening around the world and we are soaked into it. And so we live in a world that is post 9-11 where security is heightened, where it is really common for our peers to die or have there are mass shootings or terrorist attacks. And so there's a lot of this just like burdensome information that's going around. Mm. And so when I think too about um, just like discipleship and what happens in the church and the answer being in a lot of churches, like, okay, like let's, let's get folks plugged into Bible studies. I think that is important and that informs how, um, it informs our purpose and identity so that when we do work or we are, are doing things that are of, um, out of love and overflow that of love that God has mm -hmm. for us, that is not in vain. That is not motivated out of like selfish ambition, but it's like our hearts are informed by the scripture. But I think there are things in life, like all of the, the negative burdensome things, the news headlines, the you know, during the pandemic, I think 80% or 81% of um, Gen Z said that they weren't scared of the actual pandemic or like the illness, COVID-19 itself. They were scared of isolation. Mm. And so there is this like this mental health crisis going on in my generation where it's not necessarily like Bible study is going to resolve it. I think in a lot of ways we are looking at all of the world's problems. We're looking at our own problems, our own mental health, and it's not one more Bible study will fix it, but like how for the believer it is, how is like the Christian walk, how is Jesus impacting, like what does it mean to cast all your anxieties on God? What does it mean to, um, you know, your yoke is easy and burden is light? Like what do those things actually mean when they are applied? Like, um, so I think we are at least the believing Gen Z is looking for purpose and like actually putting those things into action. Um, they want to see things being done. They want to see faith that is impactful. Um, I think just asking, or I was watching this video, like a panel discussion of young adults and why they had left the church. And this, this girl had said like, I left because I saw my parents' faith and they just went to church every Sunday and there was never any like anything about their lives that looked different from mm -hmm. other than we had a Sunday morning commitment. And so she was like, I, you know, I only want to pay for something that is valuable. I only want to spend my time on something where like people give something up because it has value. And so she's like, I didn't see that with my parents. I didn't see the value that faith had. And so for believing Gen Z, it's like, okay, we want our faith to mean something. We want it to be of value. We want there to be cost. We want our lives to look different in every way, shape, and form. And I think on the flip side, the non-believing Gen Z is looking for still asking the same questions of like, there are a lot of, there's social unrest happening. There's mental health and the church doesn't seem to be resolving it. And so I'm going to look to every single other medium and content because I have access to it in a way that works for me and provides relief. Mm -hmm. I think you gave me a lot of insight. And before we get to you, Matt, I might pick Lindsay's brain a little bit more on this. So if you grew up with technology, and that's the thing with Gen Z, is that you've never known a time without it. Um, I knew a time without it. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, it was probably really coming into your life. Um, it was changing, like mm -hmm. the internet, you know, started almost when you guys were, when you were born, maybe just a little bit before, but it really wasn't common yet, mm -hmm. becoming more common in your life. Um, so I knew a time when none of those, I mean, we didn't have the iPhone and I think the iPhone changed everything. But what you said, Lindsay, was really intriguing because if you grew up in a time and your world was chaotic and your world was um, 10,000 messages a day. Um, 
I can imagine in that kind of chaos, if you will, um, social media, you can never get away from it, technology 24-7. Um, we used to be able to go home from school and leave all the bad stuff at school and go home and have a different environment that's different today. So I could see why in an environment of being inundated, it's it takes more effort and it's more important to find something of meaning of value mm -hmm. because so much of what you see is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt, kind of piggyback, think about um, just growing up, mm -hmm. technology in your life. Um, you probably transitioned to what Lindsay's talking about, but mm -hmm. didn't necessarily have it when you were younger. Maybe kind of speak into that. Yeah, I remember actually getting the America Online disc from like Walmart. Like mom and dad, we got to pick that, that, that up. Yeah, America <laughs> Online, that was it. That was that was the, the thing. That was AOL Instant Messenger. That was like the first kind of instant messaging kind of app that ever existed. That was kind of mass market. Um, any millennial out there can remember, you got mail. Uh, and it's just oh, yeah. when you logged in and you had your email, that's what too. it would say. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that's right. Um, but those are things that I grew up and I remember I remember actually going to a college and I played like the, um, the dial-up tone when you would log on and oh, yeah. go, on, go online. Uh, I played it to a bunch of college kids, and they were like, what is that sound? I was like, I know, it was awful. Uh, you couldn't pick up the landline and be on the internet at the same time, like mm -hmm. all these things. It was just, it's a vastly different world, but I grew up with it, and I remember being kind of, I'm sort of the quote-unquote tech person on staff, <laughs> but I just grew up with that. I just, I liked it. I liked, I thought I had a natural interest and an affinity to it, um, but it had definitely changed. I mean, that's the iPhone came out when I was in college, mm. the very first one. I remember my buddy Josiah had one, and I had like it was like one of those phones you would flip up and you could type on it. Yeah, it had mm -hmm. a keyboard underneath, um, and I didn't get a, a smartphone until I don't know. I think it, it was a while. It was Gen, Gen six iPhone six it was when I actually forgot the first like iPhone. Um, <clears throat> so totally different. Um, it was never as ubiquitous as it is for Lindsay. Um, I don't feel as, but I mean, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm definitely invested and involved in social media, but it's, there's kind of a, I definitely have a distance. My, my own speaking personally, uh, my own habits are different. Um, but yeah, I just noticed that slide of just negativity. I really resonated with that one documentary called, um, that came out on Netflix that describes the the patterns and the the psychology behind Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. and all the things that were developed through that, like the like button and all the psychology included in that. And it's just disturbing. So it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't check it. I don't really get involved and invested in it. Um, and I try and set up things that I block it because just like Lindsay is describing, there's a lot of negativity. And as you're alluding mm -hmm. to, I just don't, I don't really want that. I want meaning and purpose. I want to see positive things around me. And I think that's what my generation is longing for and looking for as well. Um, there's a lot of injustice. And I think probably the frustration with the boomer church um, is this, like it is that harbor thing, like what we're doing does not lend value. It's not changing this world that is absolutely chaotic. It's not seeing, you know, I think there's been a lot of desire to see, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Like, we aren't seeing the kingdom come. We're not seeing God's will be done in our world. There's a lot of poor, hurting uh, people who are suffering injustice, and the church has done nothing with that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, one more Bible study, it's not going to fix it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't address the deep need that we see in our, in our world um, of compassion fatigue mm -hmm. is a thing because of the bad news, all the headlines that you see all over the world. How can I possibly make a difference when the the amount of pain in our world is so vast? Mm -hmm. This is really interesting because if I go back in history, um, just in the church, I remember years and years ago, you know, saying to God, I wish it was like a skunk, you know, like, like, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm, take a sure. peek, yeah. you know, like Carry in on. the back, are they a believer or are they unbliever? Because they act okay. so much the same. Oh. And that's what I mean by that. Okay. Like, you know... Like, which one's a believer? Mm -hmm. Which one's the unbeliever? Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell because they were so identical in our world. I mean, in the community I was growing, you know, that I was serving as a pastor, that you'd be talking to somebody and you go, 
I bet they're a believer. Mm -hmm. And then you find out, oh, they're not a believer. And others, oh, they're a believer. Oh, no, they're not a believer. You can never really tell. So I think the church was different. And I think being in that atmosphere, I think the things that the church was doing, like I remember we'd have a chili supper and it was crazy how many people from the community would show up for a chili supper because mm -hmm. the church was offering a chili supper. We had a nice Christmas program and we only had 1,800 people in the town and we'd have mm -hmm. 600 people that mm -hmm. would show up in multiple um, services or mm -hmm. programs that we were doing with kids. See, the community would come to the church because it was not foreign. It was just a natural, like, oh, I don't go there. Um, I may not even be a believer, but I'm so happy to go to church because, you know, you're all my friends. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so I think what happened, though, if we used the Beyond the Breakwater, if we were all out there together, it almost seems like um, it became more predominant where the church was almost like uh, we've talked about there's like a gravitational pull into the harbor almost like the the church drifted into beyond the you know this side of the breakwater and slowly kept going into the harbor but they never changed they just kept doing what they've always done and i think they lost their relevancy that at one point was very dominant very predominant in the communities mm -hmm. they were serving now has become really irrelevant Mm -hmm. And in those harbors. So we're not really seeing churches like, hey, you got to change your behavior. Um, it's, if I would give an example, it's like Sears. You know, Sears was so strong when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, their catalog, you know, I mean, everybody ordered out of the catalog. It was like the Amazon of when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And they went out of existence because they almost like drifted right into the harbor. They became irrelevant in our society. Mm -hmm. um, that was the church. So you guys, I think it's different because you're seeing immediately, like, why is the church sitting in the harbor and mm -hmm. all these things are going on outside the harbor? And how come the church isn't doing anything? And I think the church is like, well, we've, we're doing what we've, always, what we've always done. We didn't change. And that's the problem. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to meaning and purpose. I think it's one of those interesting things. As a believer, where does your meaning and purpose come from? I mean, the right answer is yeah. <laughs> well, it is, is give from, us the right from, answer, and then give yeah. us the real answer. Yeah, there's. I mean, it does. It both. It's both. It's it's from Jesus Christ. I do remember there was a very significant moment in my church planting journey where I had, um, I was planting this church. It was launched in 2019, just before the pandemic, and it was. Um, we're going to build momentum. That, that was kind of the hope and the prayer is like, we're going to keep on going. God's called us out here. We're going to start this church because that's why we're here. And then we start the church in the movie theater and we're carrying on. It's it's not where we wanted it to be in terms of attendance and, and growth, but we were hoping it would get there. And then boom, pandemic, um, as it was, as we all experienced, total momentum killer. Um, and, I, and I saw this church that I had dreamed about, that I had you know, finally had manifested before my eyes, like this thing is actually happening. We're actually doing worship services mm -hmm. in the church in this, in this movie theater. And then it was done. And I'm like, God, I think this is going to fail. And it was awful. It was absolutely awful. And um, what I had to be repointed to, and I think that's something that um, is really necessary in the church today, is being reoriented toward the gospel that, uh, and I do, there's not very many times I feel like God has spoken directly to me, but the thing that he spoke to me in the moment of, I was, I kept praying like, God, what if this fails? What if this fails? And he got, uh, God spoke and responded once, um, very real. I still remember it to this day where I was, what happened and what we were about to do. We we're going to go hiking and we were listening to this prayer podcast kind of thing. And I just turned, turned to prayer and I said, God, what if this fails? And at least as if he were cutting me off at the last couple words, and you'll still be my son. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. It was hugely powerful. And that was like, okay. It, it took a while for this sink in, mm -hmm. but it was a truth I desperately needed to hear that I was his son, that even if I failed, even if I succeeded, that's not where it came from. But where I find, so what I, what I was still looking for and hungering for was not a church that was just kind of ho-hum, we're doing, we're doing service, we're going to do it the best of our ability, but we're not involved in the community. We don't really care. Um, we care, but they need to just come here, you know. Um, I was really kind of wanting that missional church. From the beginning of trying getting into ministry, my vicarage church in our tradition, it's like the third-year seminary is like going to an internship. And so 
I went out there. I'm like, I want to be in a missional place. And I when I when you guy was when Messiah called me, I looked at the website. I'm like, holy smokes, this is awesome. What's going on here is incredible. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it. I've known that there are churches that do mercy and justice work in the community, but I'd never seen it to this level. Mm -hmm. And that was what really compelled me and excited me that it was, okay, this is a missional church if I've ever seen one. And that's what I really wanted to be part of. So that's what gives me meaning. That's what excites me and kind of lights a fire. Mm -hmm. So your purpose is coming from a relationship with Christ. I mean, yes. if, if for you to kind of hear God say to you, you know, you're my son, you'll always be my son. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of identity in that. There's a lot of meaning and purpose Huge. in that. Um, mm -hmm. So, Lindsay, I, I know we've talked. Uh, you've got a lot of friends mm -hmm. um, back in Grand Rapids, that, and many of them are not believers. Yeah. Can you speak on their behalf? Mm -hmm. Where does meaning and purpose come for somebody who is Gen Z, grows mm -hmm. up in a chaos world, mm -hmm. um, pandemic, racism, um, all the things that, that we're dealing with now as a society, You've got unbelieving friends. Where are they finding this mm. meaning? Gosh, I think, yeah, that's a tough, it's a tough question, but I think like a lot of it is in how they can be used for the the betterment of society or just in their close mm -hmm. circles. Like they want to see impact. They want to see their lives change. And so I see a lot of people kind of like, if they're not in the church, um, they're trying to find that in their work. And I think that's where a lot of tension exists because if you're doing something that is more mundane or you're, I don't know, you're an accountant or you're doing tax or you're um, like in the hotel industry, I'm just naming like friends that I have that I've heard these conversations through. It's like they're bouncing from job to job to job to job within like two or three year time frame just trying to find something where they can have an impact that they're not having to start at like the bottom of the ladder but it's like there is this desire to to have a voice already to have um the ear of the ceo to to do something and so i think if that also cannot be fulfilled in church because they're not in church if it can't be fulfilled in their jobs um the next best thing is where can I invest my money? Mm. Um, and I was doing some, like reading some articles about this, listening to podcasts and um, talking to some like financial advising people and just hearing what the, the landscape of that is today. And from what I was reading, it was saying that like Gen Z and millennial, like as inflation goes up, they will kind of make sacrifices and more of the luxurious things that they're spending their money on, but they won't make any cuts on like what they are giving to. Hmm. And they are also no longer giving to churches or like religious institutions. They're giving to places in Africa that give a family a goat or to like places that where their dollar has an impact. Um, and so I think they they don't want to just give to something that has like overhead costs. They want to see it change a life it, it very explicitly. And I even think like my own brother, he, he uh, lived in Midland for a while. He moved out to Grand Rapids for a year. And I don't think it was he said until he moved to Grand Rapids and then he was back here visiting one Sunday and he heard a story about someone um, who was disabled, got a handicap accessible van um, that they had been looking. And he was like, that's awesome. And so mm. the church he was attending out there, um, I won't get into the details of it, but he was just like, I'm going to start giving to Messiah because I know that like my money is not going to go into the thousands of dollars at mm. this church into their overhead or making the building look immaculate or better. But like my dollar is going to somebody who needs it. Mm. There's a term for that donor directed dollars. Mm. Uh, that's interesting that Gen Z you just said some really interesting things about how they're looking for meaning and purpose in life. Mm -hmm. Maybe can't mm -hmm. find it because they don't have an identity in Christ. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you came from a headhunter mm -hmm. job. Um, how much meaning and purpose was that were you finding? It was hard. <laughs> okay, let's I leave it love at that because we don't want to yeah. speak bad of anything. But I mean, it was that was probably hard to find meaning mm -hmm. and purpose there. Yeah, and um, I mean, to that point, it's like then I could try to find that in other ways of like 
gifts being used that I feel like God has blessed me with. Um, but even just jumping back real quick into like what, what people are spending their money on. I feel like Matt, you can probably identify with this, but like, I feel like Gen Z and millennial are really interested in like the brands of things too. And like sustainability Mm -hmm. and things where it's like, okay, we want, if we're going to buy a a water bottle, we want to make sure it's not damaging to the environment. Um, instead Mm -hmm. of just like wearing a name brand, they want to join it and become a part of it and a part of something. And it's like, you can take Patagonia where it's like, they, they have good quality products, but then it's like, you look at like what they stand for. And it's like, you can have a company that, that they put their name on something, social justice, and Mm -hmm. people will pay hundreds of dollars for a product that is essentially something the same you can find at a thrift store, but it's the brand that you are joining and being a part of. Yeah, so, there's identity in those things. And uh, it's like, the, what's what's strange though, it makes me think of this book, um, Seculosity by David Zoll. And he's he had, he had touches on all of these different areas of what he calls enoughness, this efficiency. Mm-hmm. Like I need to, whether it's in food and what I eat or it's how I look and you know, cosmetics and beauty or it's um, it's the it's the philanthropic kind of endeavors that people look after. It's ironically, it's like I'm going to find my enoughness here and I'm going to feel good about it because it's making a difference in someone's life. But there's not a lot of like oftentimes it's like there's not a lot of traumatic or dramatic life change in that person. It's like I'm buying these sneakers because they give a pair of sneakers to a kid in Africa. Like, and so, you know, I'll pat myself on the back and I'll feel Mm -hmm. good about it. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out that, okay, it's actually destructive to do that because they're giving these shoes to a community that could have all have made those shoes. And then you're robbing people of work. And then it's like, you're perpetuating the cycle of poverty. Like, and then that, that's kind of like another layer (laughs) of things that we've discovered. Um, So there's, and I still, but I still think that that pattern of behavior is still true. Like we're going to find the thing that makes us feel good. So we're going to give the money um, and we're going to b- buy the pair of shoes that donates a pair of shoes. And that that kind of s- puts some salve on this wound that's crying out, like, I want meaning and purpose. Um, and it sort of makes us feel a tiny bit better. But I think deep down, I think mm-hmm. we all recognize and realize, and like all the, kind of your friends, like, this isn't it. Mm-hmm. There's still a void here. There's mm-hmm. still emptiness here. Mm-hmm. Even I could do all the good things that I want in the world. But, you know. This is why I'm enjoying the conversation uh, immeasurably because those those things that you're talking about, I don't think are in any boomers. I mean, I know that's a generalization, but I, boomers don't think that way. So trying to find meaning and purpose in life, I mean, it sounds like then you're doing it through things that you wear, things that you buy, water that you go um, that you get. Mm-hmm. Um, it's giving to somebody to get a goat, you know, only to find out maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. Now that didn't work out real well, so now I gotta look somewhere else. It almost seems like this relentless pursuit somewhere to find meaning and purpose. Mm-hmm. And this is what I think is a shame. Now now just think about our beyond the breakwater for a minute. And uh, I know we're running out of time here. But I want to I want to apply the model to this. If churches would really grab on to doing ministry beyond the breakwater. When you said you found out about Messiah, you've been at Messiah for a while, Lindsay, and you've talked about how it would be hard for you to go to another church that isn't really beyond the breakwater. The church seems like it has a phenomenal opportunity to speak into the lives of Gen Z millennials and offer meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? I mean, just from both of your angles, do you see how the church could be a solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we have the solution Mm -hmm. and it is the one who gives us true meaning. As St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. So we can look, we can, that a person could do anything that they ever wanted and they could make all the, this a wonderful difference in the world. But apart from, it's like, you know, writing a check and you, know, you have six zeros, but without the one in front of it, it's just a bunch of zeros. And I think that's what people come up. They start, they continue to continuously feel bankrupt because it's never enough. I never feel like I'm enough. There's always more. And I think Jesus gives us that absolute enoughness level. And from that fullness, we can actually operate in our vocations, in our, in our, in our, 
places of work and see things through new eyes and know that God, we are we are God's hands and feet in this world, a world that he cares very much about, and he will see to it that he will restore things and bring... And there's, a, there's an end of the story, too. So I think that there's a lot of things in the Christian story that bring resolution to those heartfelt needs and respond, help us do those things that we want, like the meaning, the purpose, the justice, the mercy, and it gives us new energy, new fire to, to do those things and do them with joy and confidence that God will see it through, and he wants to actually use us to do, do those kinds of things. Okay, so if meaning and purpose is found in Christ, but we just talked about how many of your friends don't know Christ and don't have that, so it seems to me then maybe the church has an opportunity to do something beyond the breakwater that's meaningful and of purpose mm-hmm. that doesn't lead with Christ because they your friends may not be looking for that who don't know Christ, um, but they can lead through a different kind of a ministry mm-hmm. where the whole purpose of it is because of what Christ has done for us. Mm-hmm. So it seems to me, um, this is interesting, we're almost running around in a circle like, if meaning and purpose comes from Christ, then the church should be doing something in response to that faith that it now has mm-hmm. that serves and gives meaning and purpose to others. Mm-hmm. And people who don't know Christ can maybe benefit from the things that are in beyond the breakwater that are giving meaning and purpose that are then leading them into a relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's just a more holistic approach. I yes. think... You know, like when you you think about discipleship and what that means for the typical church, it's like you have your your leadership pipeline of things where it's like you have the the guest, you have the then member, you have the apprentice and then the or volunteer, and then you have the leader and then the leader of leaders. And it's like almost like, okay, if you make it to that level, like now you're capped out and you will like kind of plateau but like maybe you'll continue growing because you know how to do it but then you're just in this cycle of like raising up more um guests to members to apprentice to leaders Mm -hmm. and in that cycle over and over and over again but i think it is missing the avenue to then like okay but what what does that look like outside of that cycle and providing another avenue to then like have influence in your community and to go out into you know to what is the the verse where it's like bear uh keep in Beautiful repentance feet. bear fruit oh <laughs> bear fruit and keeping with repentance yes yes yeah yeah and so it's like there there is this like as you, you are saved you you will continue to bear did you say beautiful yeah, feet? Yeah, I thought you were just like, you know, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? Like, that's the thing. I think we should have quit about a minute ago. <laughs> We've lost people. They're gone. <laughs> um, whew, but, um, wow, yep, that train left the station. Now I can't. Yeah. But Bearing fruit. Yeah, yeah bearing fruit. Bearing fruit and, bearing fruit mm-hmm. and that repentance. That goes beyond. Going yep, beyond Going beyond, the going into and your into community. community yes. And I think, like, as I look, too, about, like, the church having a really great opportunity to to serve those in the community. And I think even, okay, what we have that pipeline and that that leadership track. And I think a lot of times in the church, it's like, okay, I have somebody who is saying they're they're all in, they're ready to go. Like, put me in coach. Where can I go? Where can I serve? Okay, what do you like to do? Where are you gifted? What are you passionate about? Mm-hmm. Well, I like, I love kids. I'm really good with kids. I like would love to, um, like, I'm good with soothing them, nurturing them. I have all these really great qualities. And it's like, bam, got it. You're in the nursery. We'll put you in the nursery every Sunday morning. And I just have to wonder, like, was God raising up that person to maybe have their gifts applied mm. in the community to have mm-hmm. an impact in the community? Could mm-hmm. they have child care? Could we provide like some type of daycare? Um, something like that. And I think, at least for me, I feel like recently, like we went to the three of us, we were in Grand Rapids and we went and just shared a meal with the homeless population there. And I think me and my friends kind of joke about like, I think God has given me this gift to like listen to people in a way where all of a sudden it's like the floodgates are open and they're like, I just told you something that I've never told anybody before. And I don't know why I told you that because I don't really know you that well, but you just seem like someone who I can listen to and or who listens to me. And sometimes that's like, it's a blessing and a curse. And I feel like I've felt the abuse of that a lot, Mm. but in Grand Rapids to just sit there on the pavement with people and just listen to their stories 
to people who have said like we are so overlooked and forgotten and we don't want to give anybody a reason to think that we're begging or to have this label or stereotype over us and after leaving there I was like man I just feel like that was one of the first times that like I felt used and not abused like Mm. I my gift was put to use in a way that was impactful for ministry in the kingdom of God. And so I think that is where the church can start to become an intersection for giving people purpose and carrying on the mission of Jesus to do the very same thing that he came to do and and seeking and saving the lost Mm -hmm. and meeting both the emotional and spiritual and physical needs of, of people. And I think that's a tremendous challenge for the Boomer Church today. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to wrap up. Man. So, Lindsay, shoes on the other foot. What would you recommend to listeners before we uh... go listen to Forrest Frank? <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> yes, amen. Who? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Ed. Do that when you leave here. Um, man, what to do? I think it's hard because I would say go to the like go to a church and see where you can start to plug in, but it's it's hard because there aren't many churches that are doing that. Um, but I think maybe just start to assess your gifts. Think about, especially I'm thinking of the listeners, um, who are tuned in to be on the breakwater. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of them are, are believers or are in the church already. And so I think maybe do just that, like think about what your gifts are, maybe the passions that God is Mm -hmm. stirring in your heart and rather than applying it to the church and how the church can serve the church, like apply it to how the church can serve its community. So start to think about where God can be calling you. That's beyond the breakwater, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining in, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater, a podcast of Elevate Community Ministries. Don't let the conversation stop here. You can email us at hello at beyondthebreakwater.org. We would love to chat with you, answer questions, plan a visit, and help you take your next step. We'll see you next week.